Good evening, and we are really excited for tonight's Wu University webinar, Getting Started with OCT with Dr. Julie Rodman. I'm your host tonight, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. So I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Julie Rodman. She's the Chief of Broward Eye Care Institute in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and is a professor of optometry at Nova, Nova Southeastern University. She's the instructor of record for posterior segment disease at the college. Her research interests include OCT, OCTA, and vitreoretinal disease. She has authored over 30 publications with an emphasis on retinal disease and recently published Optical Coherence Tomography Atlas, a case study approach, the first reference book of this topic written by an optometrist. Dr. Rodman is a member of the AOA, AAO, FOA, and ORS. She has been the recipient of numerous teaching awards, was recognized as a primary care optometry news top 300 optometrist and Newsweek best optometrist of 2022. These are her financial disclosures and all financial relationships have been mitigated. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn that over to Dr. Rodman. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. I'm really excited to be here with all of you tonight talking about my biggest passion, OCT. Um, as Dr. Stewart said, please feel free to put questions into the chat and we will try to address as many as we can at the end. So. I'm going to start off with this simple anatomy slide really to emphasize the point that in order to really understand OCT, you have to understand retinal anatomy. So I want to do a very quick overview here of really what the retinal anatomy is made up of. Up here, we have our vitreous. Directly underneath the vitreous, we have our inner limiting membrane. The inner limiting membrane is very, very important because essentially it keeps the vitreous contents where they belong and the retinal contents where they belong. Then we have essentially what we call the sensory retina. The sensory retina is made up of the nerve fiber layer, followed by the ganglion cell layer. Then we have our plexiform and nuclear layers. We first have our inner plexiform and inner nuclear layers, then our outer plexiform and outer nuclear layers. That's followed by the outer or external limiting membrane, then our rods and cones or our photoreceptors. So really the ILM down to, let's say the external or outer limiting membrane is what's gonna make up the sensory retina. Then I said the photoreceptors, then the RPE. The RPE is also an, a, very, a very important boundary because it separates our sensory retina and photoreceptors from the choroid. And we know that the choroid is made up of blood. It's the powerhouse of the eye. And we wanna keep that blood out of the sensory retina. So having an intact RPE is how the eye essentially accomplishes that. So it's really important to kind of remember what this looks like as we learn OCT. So I'm going to give you a couple of terms that are important uh, when, you're under, when you're learning OCT. The first is called OCT B-scan. When you look at a picture like this, this is called a B-scan. I remember the first time someone used that word for me, I thought they were talking about ultrasound and it can be confusing because ultrasound also uses B-scan, but this is what a B-scan is called or what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if you were to superimpose that anatomy slide onto an OCT, this is what you would have. This black body on top is our vitreous. And I will tell you that most of the time we don't have a black vitreous like this. Um, if, a, if a patient is a newborn and the vitreous is attached everywhere that it's supposed to, it might look like this. If a patient has had a complete PVD, it might look like this, or maybe a vitrectomy. But most times, as you'll see throughout this presentation, you're gonna see something kind of hovering around or living in the vitreous. Then we have on top here our inner limiting membrane, which is a highly reflective tissue. When we talk about OCT, we either have hyper-reflective tissue or hypo-reflective tissue. So the ILM is a hyper-reflective tissue. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that my students make is telling me that everybody has an epiretinal membrane, right? Because of that hyper-reflectivity of the ILM. Directly beneath the ILM, we have our nerve fiber layer which houses the axons of the ganglion cells. So when you see this triangular hyper-reflective wedge, that is usually or always on the side of the eye that you're talking about. So this would be a right eye and the optic nerve would be over here on the side. Directly beneath the nerve fiber layer, we have the ganglion cell layer, which houses the cell bodies of our, of our ganglion cells. Directly beneath that, we have, as I said before, the plexiform and nuclear layers. 
the plexiform layers are going to be hyper reflective. The nuclear layers are going to be hypo reflective. So you can see here, this is our inner plexiform, whiter. Inner nuclear is lighter, is darker. Then we have the outer plexiform, lighter, followed by the outer nuclear. Then we have this powdery fine line, which is our external or inner limiting membrane over there. I'm not inner, external limiting membrane. Then we have our photoreceptor integrity line, which is this hyper-reflective band right here. This is probably one of the most important parts of the OCT or retinal anatomy mm -hmm. because the patient has to have an intact photoreceptor integrity line to have good vision, especially in the fovea. If there's a break in that photoreceptor integrity line anywhere near the fovea, then by definition, the patient really will not be 20-20. Underneath that, we have our RPE. That's this big hyper-reflective band. And there's a little lighter or darker area, I should say, in the center called the interdigitation zone. This little area in the center here is a normal hypo-reflective area where we have some densely packed cones. Underneath the RP is Brooks membrane, which you can't visualize if there is an intact RPE. And underneath that, we have our choroid. The darker areas within the choroid are the choroidal blood vessels. So this is essentially what a normal OCT should look like. And again, this is called a B-scan. The other word you should be familiar with is an ONFOS scan. So an ONFOS scan is essentially if you were to take horizontal or coronal cuts through the retinal anatomy, we'd essentially be looking at vasculature. So on the bottom here, what you can see is you can see B scans on the bottom and you can see there's these lines which are separating the B scan depending on where what you wanna look at. So here you can see the green is the more anterior, red is more posterior, and the section in the middle of those two lines is what this on FOS cut is visualizing. So essentially we're looking at the vascular supply that's feeding that part of the retinal OCTB scan. And you can see that as we course through here to different parts of the retina, the vascular pattern is going to look different. So you could have vascular on FOS cuts, you can have structural on FOS cuts, but you always wanna look at the B scan alongside it to see where you're situated. The third um, term that you should be familiar with is called EDI or enhanced depth imaging. Enhanced mm -hmm. depth imaging is really just moving your scan closer to the patient, which in, which in essence is allowing for better mm -hmm. visualization of the choroidal architecture. So on the right hand side here, you can see what a normal B scan looks like if you were to just take a retinal scan. The, on, the enhanced depth imaging scan on the left-hand side here shows you how enhanced the choroidal um, vasculature is when you move that scan closer to the patient. So those are a couple of terms that are important when you're learning OCT. So I'm going to start off really with kind of the most superficial anomalies, meaning the vitreous, and we're going to move down through the choroid. So once again, we're looking at the section right above the inner limiting membrane, which is where the vitreous lives. So as we age, two normal processes are going to happen to the vitreous. We have the process of liquefaction, also called synchesis, which is a good spelling word. Synchesis means that we're getting these lacunae or fluid-filled pockets within that vitreous gel. Totally normal age-related change. On OCT, you can see this white is the vitreous, and you can see these darker spaces within the vitreous are these lacunae or synchesis uh, process or the liquefaction process. So that's these lacunae or fluid-filled pockets. The other thing that happens as a result of aging is the synuresis or the anterior contraction of the vitreous. So you can see it kind of on the schematic here. And on the OCT, you can appreciate how the posterior hyaloid, which is the most posterior aspect of the vitreous body, is really just migrating forward or anterior on the scan. There's also areas of liquefaction as well within this vitreous body. You can also see it here, the total kind of contraction of the vitreous body anteriorly. So these are normal age-related changes that everybody that lives long enough will have. This is a nice magnified view. We call this a wide field OCT image because you can visualize both the optic nerve head here and the retina in one scan. And you can appreciate how the poster hyaloid is still attached over here 
and over here, but this entire body or this part of the hyaloid is moving anteriorly. That's the contractile property. And here is that lacunae. So when we talk about a PVD happening, right? PVDs are normal. It's a normal age-related change. What happens in the process of a PVD? What you want to look at is that posterior hyaloid. You want to see what the behavior of that tissue is doing. So in this image here, you can see the white arrow is pointing to a very faint piece of the posterior hyaloid. And what you can appreciate is that underneath this white line, it's a little bit darker. That means that the posterior hyaloid is beginning to detach in mm. one quadrant around the fovea. Here's your fovea, here's your optic nerve. You can see it's still attached over here. There's none of that, that darkness inside, meaning it hasn't detached on this side yet, but it's beginning to detach in one quadrant. This would be considered a stage one PVD. In a stage two PVD, you can see that both sides of the fovea are beginning to lift up. Both of the areas of the poster hyaloid are lifting up off of the ILM. So you're looking for this dark recess or this dark space indicating that there has been a separation between the poster hyaloid and the inner limiting membrane. In a stage three, you can see that both sides of the poster hyaloid have separated from the fovea, and all that's still attached is the optic nerve head. This would be a stage three, when both the nasal and temporal sides have detached from the fovea. In order to mark or to record a full PVD, you essentially really have to have a complete detachment, which, which I'll show you in just a minute. This is a picture of another wide field OCT, OCT image in a high myope. High myopes are very, very hard to image because of this kind of concavity of the image. It makes a very big U shape. You can appreciate here that this side is coming up and so is this side. So this would be considered a stage two. It's still attached at the fovea and at the nerve. In order again to have a complete PVD or a stage four PVD, the vitreous has to detach from the optic nerve head. Once the vitreous has detached from both the fovea and the optic nerve head, you can see that it has completely floated up into free space. That's a stage four indicated by a Weiss ring. That Weiss ring is a round ring that suspends right above the optic nerve head. And again, is an indication that the vitreous has completely detached from both the optic nerve head and the fovea. In this image down on the right, you can see that the vitreous is gone, meaning that it probably has migrated too far up in the scan to be visualized on the OCT. The next kind of anomaly of the vitro-retinal interface is something called vitreomacular traction. Vitromacular traction is where you have an anatomic abnormality or obscuration caused by the tractional forces of the vitreous. You have to look at the three millimeter radius right at the fovea to determine if the patient has vitromacular traction. What you're seeing here is that the ILM is being pulled up here by the poster hyaloid of the vitreous. The International Vitromacular Traction Study Group looked at you know patients that had VMT, patients that had macular holes, and they wanted to come up with a category, a system to classify these patients. And really the purpose was to determine what the prognosis would be in patients with different types of VMT and macular holes. So the first way that you classify VMT is by looking at the size of the traction. So what you're noticing here, if you look at point A to point B, of attachment, it's a very small attachment. It measures less than 1500 microns. When something measures less, where when the traction measures less than 1500 microns, that's called focal VMT. Here's another example, point A to point B. And all of the OCT machines have rulers on them. So essentially you could take the ruler or the caliper and you can measure the distance between point A and point B so you can be sure. In broad, the points of attachment are larger than 1500 microns. So here's point at point of attachment A, point of attachment B, point of attachment A, point of attachment B, somewhere down here. So you're probably wondering again, why does it matter? And really the answer is the prognosis differs. Patients that have focal VMT are more prone to going on to develop a full thickness macular hole and therefore have not as good of a visual prognosis as someone that has broad because broad might result more just in a general overall thickening of the retina versus someone that has focal. 
The other way that we categorize these, we look at size, and then we look at what I call the company that the VMT keeps. If the VMT is happening by itself, nothing else is happening, it's called isolated. So this one I would call a focal isolated VMT. The one on the bottom, you can see that the patient has a little abnormality here, which we'll get to later on in the presentation. So this one I would call broad concurrent VMT because there's other disease processes happening simultaneously with the VMT. The other thing that happens, which is a normal thing, is actually I shouldn't say it's normal, but as PVD progresses, if you don't get VMT, you're lucky, but you may get an epiretinal membrane. What is an epiretinal membrane? It's when the vitreous is not detaching properly from the inner limiting membrane. So we get ERMs from anomalous PVDs. ERMs are defined as proliferation of glial cells. The glial cells live in the inner limiting membrane. So again, if you have an anomalous PVD and the vitreous is not detaching properly, then you can get proliferation of glial cells forming this scaffolding or this epiretinal membrane formation. There are two types of epiretinal membranes. We call them grade one and grade two. Really what this correlates with is the severity of the epiretinal membrane. So a grade one epiretinal membrane is where you can see this cellophane-like tissue kind of hovering in the posterior pole here, but the, the blood vessels and the surrounding area look fairly normal aside from that cellophane-ish like appearance. And on, I'll show you in just a minute. It's very difficult on OCT sometimes to appreciate if it's an ERM type one or type two. This would be a type two. Here you can see a lot more fibrosis, a lot more traction from that epiretinal membrane. What's happening is that the vessels underneath are getting pulled alongside this scaffold. So when the vessels change what we call trajectory, that is called a grade two epiretinal membrane. And obviously grade two doesn't have as good of a visual prognosis as type one. These are kind of some flavors or some varieties of what epiretinal membrane might look like. You can see here this thick, thick band here is that scaffold or the glial cell proliferation. And that is resulting in this kind of tractional force on the retina, resulting in thickening, thickening of the overall retinal contour. Here again, you can see the epiretinal membrane here and some sawtoothing. So when the, the, when the ILM is just attached kind of at pinpoint locations, we call that sawtoothing. Over here, it's not as obvious that there's a scaffold, but you can see again that little kind of these corrugations resulting in these little cystic filled space, cystic spaces, because it's almost like if you took a tennis sock and you pulled it, you'd begin to see fenestrations in the tissue from pulling with force in that direction. Here's another really nice example of a thick epiretinal membrane with some of that sawtoothing that I talked about. And you can see the thickening, the overall thickening of the neurosensory retina. This is an onfos image. It's a structural onfos image. So we're not visualizing vasculature here, but we're visualizing the contractile bands or the contractile force of that epiretinal membrane. The other thing in this category that we worry about is the development of a full thickness macular hole. And I think that if all of these categories, the one thing that we don't want to happen is the development of a full thickness macular hole. Full thickness macular hole is defined as a complete loss of tissue from inner limiting membrane down to RPE. So when you see this clinically, what you're going to see is a maroon circle the maroon circle means that you're visualizing RPE, which is, has a maroonish color. The little yellow spots are some xanthophils or carotenoids that you can see kind of sitting in the middle there. But remember that you have to have a complete loss of tissue from ILM down to RPE. This study group I told you about before, the IVTS, not only categorized VMT, but they also categorized macular holes and said, how can we make a universal classification system based on OCT that's easy to follow? So essentially, they looked at the size of the macular hole. If at the smallest aperture on the OCT, it measured less than 200, less than or equal to 250 microns, that was considered a small full thickness macular hole. 
if it measured again at the smallest point from uh, greater than 250 but less than 400 that's considered medium and if it's greater than 400 that's considered large why do we care because the prognosis or the way that we educate our patient is going to differ depending on at the size of the hole a patient that has a small full thickness hole has a much better um, probability of doing well with surgical intervention than a patient with a large full thickness hole. They also looked at the etiology. Why did the full thickness macular hole happen? If it was because of the vitreous pulling, then that would be called primary. If it wasn't from the vitreous, it would be called secondary. So this one on top would be a large primary full thickness macular hole. The one on the bottom would probably be a medium secondary full thickness macular hole. If you've established that it's not full thickness, meaning there's some obscuration to the foveal contour, but there's still a little bit of tissue remaining, then it doesn't meet the category, it doesn't meet the definition of a full thickness hole and it's partial thickness. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on these slides because there's too much to remember, but within the category of partial thickness holes, we have lamellar holes and we have macular pseudo holes. This slide is showing you two examples of lamellar holes, tractional and degenerative. But what I want you guys to get out of it is just really to appreciate that because there's still tissue here and here, these are considered partial thickness holes. And it's super important to be able to differentiate between them because once again, the education and management is gonna be very different. This is what a, a pseudo hole would look like. Pseudo holes have this kind of U shape or sink like appearance. And you can see here that there's still tissue left over. So this would not be full thickness. This is a partial thickness hole. Okay, we're going to move into inner retina now. So we covered diseases of the vitreo retinal interface. Now we're going to go into the neurosensory or sensory retina. Remember that is from ILM really down to the external or outer limiting membrane right above the photoreceptors. So the most common disease that affects neurosensory or sensory retina is diabetes. Diabetes is a vascular disorder that affects the sensory retina. You can see that on this, um, this anatomical kind of drawing on the side here. So I started off the webinar by saying that when we learn OCT, we learn by color. Is it hyper or hypo reflective? And the nice thing about OCT is that dark or hypo reflective is really, really simple. It's either going to be serous fluid, and that's 99% of the time, or it's some kind of artifact from a blood vessel or something else, like a media opacity. Everything else is hyper reflective. Okay. Mm -hmm. So hemorrhages are hyper reflective. Hemorrhages happen somewhere up in the space of the sensory retina. So there's a lot of little white dots that you can visualize through here. Those are most likely inner retinal hemorrhages or dot and blot hemorrhages. Uh, exudates are also going to be hyperreflective. The way that we would differentiate an exudate from a hemorrhage is looking at the layer. Exudates live in the outer plexiform layer. So when you look at your picture here, you can see that this clump of exudates is living in the outer plexiform layer. And that's how we know that that's hemorrhaging and not exudation. The picture on the bottom here, here's the black or the hypo reflective spaces. That's serous fluid. 99% of the time, darkness is going to be serous fluid. This darkness is caused by a shadowing artifact from this exudate. That exudate is blocking the signal of the OCT. So you're getting a shadowing defect there. And this patient has exudate and serous fluid. Macular edema, we also have a new way of classifying using OCT. So here is what macular edema would look like. Here are our large pockets of serous fluid, lots and lots of them. Another example down here with some exudate in the outer plexiform layer. And this is called circinate exudate. Circinate means it is appearing in a circular fashion around the fovea. But what I want to emphasize in this webinar is in our new way of classifying macular edema. So when you have established that a patient has macular edema, looking for 
serous fluid, cystic pockets of fluid, looking for exudate, looking for hemorrhage. If you suspect that there is macular edema, you want to ask yourself the question, is it center involving or non-center involving? And the way that you're going to determine this is by doing OCT. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to obtain a B scan and you're going to look for the abnormalities. You can see that both of these patients have cystic pockets of fluid and they both have some exudate. There's exudate here. There's probably this patient, not so much. There might be some hemorrhages, but how do we know if this is what we call CI or center involving versus NCI DME? We get a thickness map. This little circular kind of grid is called the ETDRS grid, early treatment diabetic retinopathy study grid. These nine quadrants are the ones that we want to look at to determine how, the, how we're going to classify the macular edema. So we're going to look at the one millimeter center subfield. If this center subfield is above 250 microns, that is considered center involving DME. Okay. So this patient on top has 347. That is elevated. That's out of the normal um, limits. The one on the bottom is normal, but has a little pocket of abnormality here. So this one's considered CIDME, and this one's considered NCIDME. Why do we care? Because patients with CIDME have a 10 times more, or are 10 times more, excuse me, <clears throat> to develop vision loss than our patients with NCIDME. The other reason we care is because if a patient has center involving DME, but their vision is better than 2025, we do not have to refer them. That was um, that came out of protocol V, one of the very important studies that was done by the diabetic retinopathy group. And I, you know, still I still say to my students, yes, I probably would consider referring these patients. It's always good to co-manage, but it's also important to understand what these protocols teach us and what the guidelines are so we can properly tell our patients what to expect. So this is a really nice and easy way of using OCT to classify a diabetic macular edema. In proliferative diabetic rhinopathy, we know that neovascularization lives above the vitro-renal interface. So you can see this hyperreflectivity. blood is hyper, living again, coming up into the vitreous space. That is an indication of proliferative disease. These are two really pretty pictures of proliferative disease. Up here, you can see the posterior hyaloid and you can see underneath it, this is a pre-retinal hemorrhage. White is blood. This blood is living between the posterior hyaloid and the ILM. This is a pre-retinal or vitreous hemorrhage. It's hard to say which I would say it's pre-retinal. It's still living underneath the vitreous cavity. And here you can see an, a retinal detachment, a separation of the sensory retina over here from the RPE because of this abnormality up here, these are fibrotic neovascular fronds or bands pulling that sensory retina off of the RPE. In vein occlusions, we're gonna get lots of different types of hemorrhages with cotton wool spots. I wanted to show you on OCT what a really big cotton wool spot looks like. Remember that cotton wool spots live in the nerve fiber layer. So these are going to be very superficial, hyperreflective areas, kind of pulling or looking like it's living above the level of the retina, but it's really not because you can see it's still suspended within the sensory space. And here's just macular edema, looks very similar to our diabetic cases in a patient with hypertense with um a vein occlusion with macular edema. An artery occlusion, if you were to take a line scan through the affected area, what you'll notice in artery occlusion is hyperreflectivity or thickening of the sensory retina due to the acute infarct. If you were to move the line scan off of the affected area, you'll notice how the OCT resumes normal architecture. So this very hyper-reflective appearance shows the acute stage of the disease. If you were to look at the artery occlusion over time, this is essentially a month apart, this is the acute stage that I just showed you, that very hyper-reflective thickening of the tissue. Over time in an artery occlusion, the tissue is going to atrophy or die down and become very, very thin. For outer retinal disease, once again, we're looking at 
photoreceptors, RPE, Brooks membrane, and choroid. So diseases like age-related macular degeneration. So we'll start off with Drusen. Drusen's oftentimes mistaken for exudate. And the way that we're going to make the differentiation is we're going to look at the layers. Remember that exudate live in the outer plexiform layer. Mm -hmm. Drusen live between RPE and Brooks membrane. So when you see on OCT some hyperreflectivity between RPE and Brooks membrane, that is too low down to be exudate. That indicates that it is Drusen. So here you can see, if you look at this picture, this area here is my Drusen. It's living below the RPE, but above Brooks membrane. So all these little bumps here are Drusen. And here's a more magnified view, just so you can see. Up here is my photoreceptor integrity line. This is my RPE right here. And the abnormality is living below the RPE, but above mm -hmm. Brooks membrane. This is another example of a patient that has some pretty, I would say medium to large soft drusen. And you can, again, if you were to trace your RP over here, you can see that these elevations are living below the RPE and above Brooks membrane. So these are soft confluent drusen. You can use OCT to track drusen over time. This really just shows you how patients, you know, let's say you're, you're managing somebody with AMD and you're trying to judge if the drusen has changed in size. The change analysis is a really nice tool because increase in drusen size is an indication, obviously, that the disease is getting worse. There's also another kind of drusen called reticular pseudodrusen. Reticular pseudodrusen does not live in between RPE and Brooks membrane. It lives in the subretinal space. So if you were to look at this image here, you can appreciate that this is RPE right here. The drusen is going above the RPE. This picture down here is another really nice example. If this is your RPE here, look at how the drusen is peaking above the RPE and moving into that subretinal space. On a wider scan or on the full OCTB scan, you can see how these reticular pseudodrusen almost take like a sawtoothy appearance. They look triangular, polygonal, polygon, I don't want to say the word, but they look more pointed in appearance. And it's important to differentiate between reticular pseudodrusen and regular drusen because reticular pseudodrusen are highly correlated with the development of advanced AMD, including geographic atrophy. Let's move on to pigment epithelial detachments. So when we talk about pigment epithelial detachments, they come in three varieties, serous, drusenoid, and hemorrhagic, also called fibrovascular. Mm -hmm. So what you wanna do to differentiate between your PEDs, I'll call them, is again, to find your RPE. Anything that lifts up the RPE is a PED. The question is what is lifting up the RPE. Mm -hmm. So if you look here, you see your RPE is here, the hyperreflective band. Here, my white arrow is pointing to the RPE. You're going to look at the tissue or the coloration of what's going on underneath the RPE. If it's all black, that is a serous PED. Okay. What happens if you trace your RP over and you see that the areas underneath the RP look turbid or look kind of grayish? If that grayish color is homogenous, that is likely due to drusen. Remember that drusen are gonna live between RPE and Brooks membrane. So these are dr either large drusen or we call them drusenoid PEDs. This little black spot here is fluid that should not be there. In a hemorrhagic PED, if you trace your RP over, you'll notice that there's a lot of variability in the reflectivity pattern below the RPE. There's some hyper reflective coloration here, and there's hypo over here. When you have hypo with hyper, that is likely blood. Blood is made up of serous fluid and bloody components. So if you were to separate those on the OCT, you'll appreciate the differences in reflectivity here. So this is bleeding, this is hemorrhagic or fibrovascular. So three different varieties, all very different prognoses.
Here's an example. If Again, if you were to follow your RP over, you'll notice that the RP lifts up here and you can appreciate that there's differences in reflectivity beneath the RPE here. So this would be a fibrovascular or hemorrhagic PED. It wouldn't be drusenoid also because of the corrugations in the RPE. When you have a drusenoid PED, they're very well delineated. They're very distinct. When you have a fibrovascular hemorrhagic one, you can see there's corrugations in the contour of the RPE. And that's what you're appreciating here. These are not to be mixed up with central serous choreoretinopathy. In central serous choreoretinopathy, the RPE remains down. The fluid is above the RPE. So remember that always look at your RPE. If the RPE goes up, that's a PED. If the RPE stays down, that's called central serous, also called a neurosensory detachment made up of black or serous fluid. You can de determine the chronicity or how long the CSR has been there because of several features. In this OCT, you can see that there's these little hyperreflective kind of dangling pieces here. These are actually dead photoreceptors. When you see little dangling pieces like this within the area of, neuro, of uh, serous fluid, that's an indication that these photoreceptors are dead and this has been around for a while. You can also appreciate over here, there's some excess hyperreflectivity, likely be the development of a coronavascular member. Remember, white means can mean a lot of things, but in this case, probably blood because there's an adjacent pocket of fluid here. So this is a patient that has long-standing CSR. And really the, the lesson with CSR is that if it doesn't go away by three months, we really should be sending these patients out because we don't want the development of a coronavascular membrane to occur. Oftentimes CSR and PEDs happen in yeah. harmony, meaning they happen, or I should say together. Here you can see a PED. You can see that the RPE is lifted up. And here you can see that the RPE is down. So this is your CSR here, and this is your PED here. Down here, once again, here is your PED. Okay, RP is lifted up. Here your RPE is down. So this is your serous, your neurosensory detachment of your CSR. And here's a little bit of fluid also. So a little sensory detachment there also. So when we talk about AMD, the main thing that we want to, or one of the main things, aside from looking for drusen size and pigmentary changes, the main thing we really want to assess for is the presence or absence of bleeding and looking for coronavascular membranes. And we don't have to go into a ton of detail on this, but what you want to assess for is any, again, areas of hyperreflectivity that should not be there. So if you look here and find your RPE and you kind of trace it over, what you'll appreciate with this blue arrow is that there's areas of varying reflectivity under the RPE. And this is going to look very similar to what I just showed you, the hemorrhagic or fibrovascular PED is going to look like, because guess what? That's the same as an occult neovascular membrane. Occult neovascular membranes live below the RPE. So if you have, again, elevation of the RPE with abnormal reflectivity underneath it, that is likely going to be either, we could call it hemorrhagic fibrovascular PED, also known as an occult choroidal neovascular membrane. Here's an example. Once again, if you find your RPE, trace it over. The first thing you notice here is there's a little pocket of fluid that should not be there. The RP is going up and underneath it is all of this abnormal variability in reflectivity suggestive of a, an occult coronavascular membrane. This patient has the teleform dystrophy, which is a buildup of lipofusin. Again, RP is lifted up and you can see that there are some anomalous characteristics, but look how homogenous the coloration is underneath the RPE. So this patient has vitelliform. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide because we're, we didn't really talk about vitelliform, but it also, it, it can mimic what a coronavascular membrane looks like. In a type two or classic 
CNV, the abnormality is going to live above the RPE. So once again, find your RPE, trace it over. The blue arrow is pointing to this anomalous area of reflectivity above the RPE. And you can see there's some adjacent pockets of fluid and little hyperreflective dots, which are likely hemorrhages. So this abnormal area is above the RPE, and we call that a classic or type 2 CNV. This one here, find your RPE, follow it over. There's like three lumps here. This patient either has three really, really big drusenoid PEDs, or this could actually be an occult membrane. Okay. The reason I'm leaning towards occult membrane is because you can see there's some abnormality over here, some hypo reflectivity that should not be there separating the photoreceptor integrity line from the RPE. This is how meticulous you have to be when you're looking at OCT scans. You gotta look really carefully at all of these areas on the scan to make sure that you're not missing something. This patient has also an occult membrane. Follow the RP over. The area of abnormality is living below the RP. This whole area here is abnormal. This is a type one or occult membrane. Notice that there's fluid here and probably some exudate as well. That should not be there. The other type of advanced AMD is geographic atrophy. This is the dry form of advanced AMD. Geographic atrophy is defined as a loss of the retinal tissue with some either full attenuation or loss of the RPE, allowing for visualization of the underlying sclera and choroid. And you can see this patient has center involving geographic atrophy or foveal involving, I should say, geographic atrophy. On OCT, what you'll appreciate is from point A here, to point B here, you can see that there is complete loss of the RPE. This line is Brooks membrane. So that is why you're visualizing all the way down to the choroidal vasculature here. Because the RPE is missing, that there's what we call hypertransmission of the signal. The RPE usually is a highly reflective tissue. If the RP is missing, all of that reflectivity is going to sink down into that choroidal space. Geographic atrophy can take on many appearances. Sometimes there's no sensory retina left. Other times, as in this case, there's some left. But what you're looking for is a loss or attenuation to the RP with this sinking down of the outer retinal tissue. Here's another example of geographic atrophy with less of the sensory retina visible. That's what I was trying, that's what I was saying here. Here you have some sensory retina. In this one, it looks like it's almost completely missing. And look at your RP here. It's just, it's gone. All you see here is Brooks membrane with this transmission defect, this hypertransmission defect into the choroid. And you can see these little bumps here are drusen living between the RPE and Brooks membrane. For purposes of time, I think we have a few minutes left. Let me skip over polypoidal. I'm gonna go over OCT of the optic nerve because I know this is always an area of interest and this is how I'll end. So I think one of the biggest things that I'm always asked is, how do we differentiate between papilledema and optic nerve hydrosis on OCT? And I will preface what I'm about to say with, I still think that ultrasound is, or I, I know that ultrasound is the gold standard for diagnosing optic nerve head drusen. OCT can be used as an adjunct, but it certainly shouldn't be the game changer, okay? But when we look at the normal optic nerve, it makes a U-shape, okay? It makes a U-shaped contour. We know that in papilledema, we lose that U-shaped contour. But just a couple of little tips, maybe these will help. We're looking for smooth elevation, Okay, you see here, this is smooth. We're looking for something called a V sign, which I put with the little red arrows here. V sign indication that there is fluid in here. Remember, fluid is dark, separating neurosensory retina from RPE. And the other thing I do is I look at the nasal quadrant map to see what the thickness is. If the RNFL on the nasal quadrant is greater than 86 microns, that tends to be more suggestive of papilledema than optic dystrusum.
You can also look at Brooks membrane. If Brooks membrane is coursing upwards, as you can see here, that means that that increased intracranial pressure is pushing Brooks membrane anteriorly. And that is more, in fact, we don't see that with optic nerve head drews. And so looking for that anterior displacement of Brooks membrane. Optic nerve head drusen, lumpy bumpy, no V sign. In fact, you can see that this is kind of a straight contour on the sides, no V sign. And Brooks membrane is going down, not up. And you can see that here, how Brooks membrane is coursing down. And just another picture of that lumpy, bumpy optic disc drusen. So I think we'll stop here.